Hello and welcome back to this discussion on endocrine emergencies. I'm Professor Adam Thompson and in this video we're going to talk about the assessment or the pre-hospital assessment to be more specific of the patient experiencing an endocrine emergency. So when it comes to the patient assessment of these patients, uh, the endocrine emergencies tend to affect many organ systems. So don't take these emergencies lightly. Just because somebody's presenting with uh, very classic symptoms associated with hypoglycemia, uh, the, the effects of that hypoglycemia are going to affect many different systems within the body. Of course, as always, it's important to be diligent in performing our scene size up, making sure we address any hazards and we follow our standard precautions, our scene safety and our BSI, right? Um, we're always going to want to check for medications that could give you clues. You know, look in the medicine cabinets, look in the refrigerator. Remember, uh, a lot of insulin is kept refrigerated. Uh, you know, look in the cupboards or the cabinets above the countertop. Uh, bring any of those medication bottles to the hospital if you must. Of course, if you could just make a list uh, of the medications and, and with the dosaging and all of that, you could do that as well. Next up, we have our primary assessment, and this is where we're going to identify and manage any life threats, and, and we're going to take care of those immediately. Uh, we're going to form our general impression, and what I tell my students to do is from the door, you know, look at your patient, what's your gut feeling, your general impression based on their positioning, on their work of breathing, and on their circulation of the skin. You know, are they pale or mottled, working hard to breathe? Are they hunched over? What's that general impression tell you? Are they sick or not sick? Um, the signs and the symptoms of an endocrine emergency are going to depend on hormone production and secretion that is affected. Is the patient alert or do they have an altered mental status? And when I say alert, are they aware of your presence automatically, like without you having to stimulate anything? Or does it require you to yell at them or to provide any kind of painful stimuli? If they have an altered mental status, that could be due to many different things. An unresponsive patient uh, could be experiencing an endocrine crisis such as hypoglycemia, right? If you do your AEIOU tips, hypoglycemia is the insulin shock, right? Um, so if somebody has, uh, you know, taken their insulin, but they didn't eat enough to counterbalance that, of course, that's going to, you know, drop their blood glucose. And if you drop somebody's blood glucose enough, it's going to affect their mental state. Hyperglycemia can also affect your mental state. Uh, you know, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis is a condition where the uh, pH levels drop in a patient due to an increase in ketones, and it can cause, uh, you know, a, a lot of different issues, including an altered mental state. Mixed edema coma is another possibility. Severe thyroid deficiency can cause an altered mental status. Uh, another thing is diaphoresis. Diaphoresis is a sign of severe distress. Whenever you see a patient that's profusely sweating, and it's an unexplained sweating, you know, it doesn't make sense. Like, they're not outside playing racquetball. They're indoors, air-conditioned, and they're sweating. Uh, th this is a severe sign of severe distress. And it is something that is present in uh, thyroid toxicosis, uh, which is, you know, like thyroid storm. A whole lot of, uh, you know, thyroid hormone is being released, causing an increase in uh, metabolism, along with a pulmonary edema, uh, you know, that could cause uh, th this uh, diaphoresis as well. As we continue our primary assessment, you're going to want to look for any signs and symptoms that are specific to the different uh, endocrine conditions, such as buffalo hump, moon face, and acne, which can all be a sign of Cushing syndrome. Uh, here we have, you know, that's an example of buffalo hump here, and these are both examples of moon face, which can occur uh, due to the steroids that they have to take for their Cushing's. Mottled skin is associated with pancreatitis. Mottled skin is, uh, you know, you see it a lot of times with a hypoperfuse patient or patients that are newly dead. Uh, they'll have that kind of uh, vasculature looking pale skin. That's called mottled skin. Enlarged or abnormal body parts can even occur with some of these conditions, uh, such as your SIADH, which is syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Uh, and then you have anasarca with mixed edema coma that could also cause enlarged or abnormal body parts. Uh, your underweight or overweight patients may also be having an endocrine dysfunction, such as hypothyroidism, even hyperthyroidism or diabetes. And, and if they have hyperthyroid, they may have Graves' disease, which can cause exophthalmus, which 
when those eyeballs look like they're bulging out of the skull, that's typically a classic finding with Graves' disease. And then uh, any abnormal development can be present in children with, with hormone deficiencies. They could have dwarfism or gigantism due to you know, the growth hormone or panhypopituitarism. Um, you know, all of these different things can cause uh, changes that are seen on the outside of the body, which are, are, are really classic for those conditions. Of course, as we move down our primary assessment, we're going to get into our ABCs. This is very important. Um, ensure that your patient's breathing adequately with a nice patent and intact airway. Uh, investigate the breathing for any abnormal breath sounds or any signs of obstruction and assess for their breathing effort. So we always say rate, rhythm, and quality of the breathing, and it gets you a lot of information very quickly. And of course, the C in our ABCs stands for circulation. And with circulation, we're going to assess the skin color, moisture, and temperature rather quickly, obtain a blood pressure and a heart rate, rhythm, and quality. Um, if your patient's pale, cool, moist, they might be a sign of shock or hypoglycemia. They could have hot, dry skin, which could be a sign of fever or hyperglycemia, and IV fluid administration or uh, blood replenishment may be necessary for these endocrine emergencies. Quite possibly one of the most important components of the primary assessment is the transport decision. Many patients should be transported to a facility that specializes in the conditions that they have. Uh, transport the patient rapidly to the closest facility if the patient's condition is unstable. Remember, th there's only so much you can do on scene. So get them to a, a facility, a receiving facility quickly, but get them to the correct facility for what their condition requires. All right, history taking is going to be another important component of the assessment. Uh, it's especially useful in the diabetic emergencies because uh, you're going to want to know what they're taking, you know, when was the last time they ate or drank, how much exercise have they been doing or physical activity, when was the last time they took their insulin, do they have an insulin pump, where is their insulin? Are they on a sliding scale? Do they have a different condition at night? You know, these, they, they may have something called sundowners where the, uh, they have different effects at night due to their blood glucose. So all these things are very important, especially with that diabetic patient. Consider the patient's signs and symptoms and any pertinent negatives. If a patient is unresponsive, you're going to want to obtain a blood glucose level, of course, and manage any abnorm abnormalities appropriately. Use that sample history, signs, symptoms, allergies, medications, past medical history, last oral intake, and events leading up to, to gather the information in a very systematic way. Um, and your signs and symptoms of endocrine disorders in patients with undiagnosed or poorly managed diabetes include polyphagia, polyuria, and polydipsia. Remember that, polyphagia, polyuria, and polydipsia. We're going to uh, review that again as we talk about the diabetic emergencies more specifically. So with hyperthyroidism and thyroid toxicosis, you might have somebody that's tachycardic or they have PVCs, you know, PACs, or uh, an atrial dysrhythmia. This is all due to, you know, a hypermetabolic state, much like if they took some sort of stimulant. You know, it's going to be very similar to somebody on, uh, you know, a sympathomimetic. Picture it that way. Uh, you want to ascertain whether they have any allergies prior to giving them any medications, of course. That's always true with any patient you treat. Document, uh, you know, the medications that the patient is currently taking and whether the patient has uh, been compliant with their regimen because that's the most common diabetic emergency is somebody that is on diabetic medications like insulin and they took it inappropriately. Uh, you know, ask your females of childbearing age about their last menstrual period um, because that could be the, the cause of the emergency you're there for. As you move on to your secondary assessment, you're going to do a physical exam with observation. Uh, of course, you're observing their general appearance, the position in which they're found, identify as many atypical findings as possible. A focus assessment is usually not necessary unless trauma is present. So do a full body scan because it's more appropriate for your medical patients. Always manage life threats first. As you find something life-threatening, make sure you treat it. Uh, Finer abnormalities will help determine the treatment. Uh, condition of the skin could be cold, clammy, which might indicate shock or severe hypoglycemia. Your cold and dry skin could indicate an overdose on sedatives um, or alcohol intoxication. Uh, your hot and dry skin is more suggestive of a hyperglycemic patient, a f you know, fever, of course. They could be septic. Uh, possibly even heat stroke. 
So when you have an unresponsive patient, you have two main goals. First, you want to determine their overall level of consciousness. Are they truly unresponsive? Are they responding to pain? Um, are, are, are they you know, experiencing some sort of stroke? And it seems like they're unresponsive, but they're just not able to communicate with you. Um, and then look for that source of coma. So we use this mnemonic, A-E-I-O-U, TIPS. It's not all-inclusive, but it includes the, probably the most common causes of an altered mental state, especially an unresponsive patient. So uh, acidosis or alcohol, epilepsy, infection, overdose, uremia, trauma or tumor, insulin, that's going to be your hypoglycemic patient, psychosis, stroke. So if you remember this A-E-I-O-U TIPS as you approach any patient with an altered mental state, um, it's going to help you just kind of have a good universal differential for those patients that's going to, for the most part, include what may be going on. As you move on and perform your vital signs, make sure you look for a combination of hypertension and bradycardia. This might be suggestive of an increased intracranial pressure. Be alert for abnormal respiratory patterns, such as your Shane Stokes breathing, which usually points to a non-neurologic source of coma. Uh, your Kussmaul's respirations are very classic for a patient that's experiencing diabetic ketoacidosis. More worrisome abnormal breathing patterns include your, your uh, central neurogenic ventilation, that's not necessarily a good sign. That's probably somebody that's having a brain bleed. And then huffing and puffing that do not seem to move much air. Uh, you know, a lot of patients that are in respiratory failure might look like that. And then look for respiratory-related motions, such as sneezing and yawning requ that require an intact brainstem. Hiccuping and coughing may actually indicate brainstem damage. A lot of times patients, uh, you know, as they uh, herniate, might have a cough or a hiccup, and you could think that that's just a normal reaction, but that is actually uh, a sign that they're getting pretty bad. So with your reassessment, you're going to want to continually reassess the patient for changes. Of course, if they're more unstable every five minutes, more stable every 15 minutes. Uh, but at, before and after any treatment is really when a reassessment should occur. A patient uh, whose gag reflex is absent cannot protect his or her own airway from aspiration, so maintain or manage that airway. Uh, obtain blood specimens early in patients with diabetes. Address the patient's emotional needs. Monitor the cardiac rhythm of every comatose patient. And during uh, neurologic assessment, the most important consideration is the trend shown by several measurements. So, uh, you know, again, perform a neurological assessment with your vital signs and, and show trends. For your patients with altered mental states, establish an IV. Uh, with a you know a saline drip or a saline lock, measure blood glucose immediately and initiate treatment. If if you know you have a reading that's less than 60 and you believe that's the cause for their altered mental state, you can give them uh, 12.5 to 25 grams of D50. Some agencies now are, are managing hypoglycemia with D10, which is actually probably a more safer therapy. It's uh, you know not increasing the blood glucose so rapidly. Uh, remember that these, uh, this dextrose is going to metabolize rather quickly. They've got to get some complex carbohydrates into their body. So generally, uh, if you get these patients awake uh, with dextrose, let's say they were comatose and their sugar was uh, very low, you give them dextrose, whether it be I mean, D25, D50, D10, whatever you give them, uh, and raise their blood glucose, now they wake up. Well, it's not unheard of for them to go back to being comatose as that insulin gets that sugar back into the blood cells and you know, their blood sugar drops again, so you, got, you might have to give them some food or some uh, substance to eat. Uh, if the patient's condition does not improve after dextrose, and if you have reason to suspect a narcotic overdose, you might want to consider administering naloxone. Again, go through your AEIOU tips. It kind of encompasses all those most common causes of uh, altered mental states. All right, when you're transporting a, a comatose patient, there's a few considerations. If they're intubated, make sure you transport them supine with a C collar on, uh, the, not because they might have trauma, but because you want to, you know, limit the likelihood of extubation. You don't want to lose that tube. If the patient is not intubated, you may uh, transport the patient in, in the stable uh, side position or the left lateral recumbent or, you know, semi-fowlers is usually the, the most preferred uh, 
position to transport a patient if there are indications of increased ICP. Of course, you want to keep that head elevated and always keep the mouth and pharynx suction free of secretions, vomitus, and blood as you transport the patient. That should go without saying, uh, but it is part of the lecture nonetheless.